Well, today on the show, I'm joined by Professor Andrew Bailey. Andrew is a philosopher, especially within the space of money and economics, although he has other interests as well. I've got Andrew on the show today to help us unpack the philosophy of money. It's a subject area that's often overlooked, and I've found that actually beginning to explore this space has helped me to uncover many questions and many rabbit holes that have led me down really interesting spaces where I've begun to understand society or see society in a new way, but also I've learned a lot about myself, my desires, my ambitions, and what I class and view value to mean. It's a really interesting conversation, and I hope it serves as an introduction to this field of philosophy that I've already mentioned is very often overlooked, because there's a vast landscape out there that's well worth exploring, and hopefully this conversation will serve as a gateway for individuals to be able to go on and explore this space. You might be able to tell that things have changed a little bit with my setup. I'm currently in the middle of a room refurb, so apologies if the noise is a bit strange. It's bouncing off the walls uh, in a weird way, but we're going to get some lining put up shortly, which should help with that. Uh, but yeah, it's really exciting to have a new space to be able to do this podcast in. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how that develops over the coming weeks and months. If it's your first time checking out the show, I'd ask that you'd hit the subscribe button. And then on YouTube, if you select the bell notification icon, that will mean you're reminded whenever we release a video here on the channel. And also, please give this video a thumbs up and then share it with family, friends, followers, whoever you think would find this to be a helpful conversation, as hopefully you enjoy delving into the philosophy of money. Enough of that. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Professor Andrew Bailey. Cheers. Hello and welcome to the show. My name's Samuel and today I'm joined by Professor Andrew Bailey. Andrew, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Samuel. So today we're going to be speaking about the philosophy of money, obviously economics, uh, that whole spectrum, which I'm really excited about because I think a lot of people probably don't understand that you can have philosophy and money coming together. Uh, so we're going to get into that. But before we dive uh, into the deep end, um, Andrew, would you mind just giving us an overview about yourself and the sort of work you do? Certainly. Perhaps most importantly, I teach in a philosophy, politics and economics program at Yale and U.S. College in Singapore. So it's a small liberal arts college jointly founded by the National University of Singapore here and Yale University in the United States. And one of the things we do, or that we try to do in that program, is to bring together those three constituent disciplines, philosophy, economics, and politics. And I found in my own teaching, and more recently in research, that money is a site where that happens, and where it happens with real vigor. You can't really think about money without think well about money without bringing in the tools of philosophy, think about what should be, and then politics, that's institutions, and economics, the study of rational behavior under scarcity. So I'm having a great time teaching these things together, and money has been where it's at for me in recent years. So when you mentioned just then philosophy, economics, politics, um, I don't know, sirens started going off my head, uh, pointing me towards sort of David Hume, Adam Smith. Uh, I've been investigating a lot of David Hume recently, uh, and he obviously wrote quite heavily on these subjects, along with Adam Smith as well, kind of a contemporary of his. I think they were friends. Um, is it kind of in that sort of vein, then, the sort of kind of way that you teach and the way that you go about doing things? Are you looking to kind of create that sort of um, cohesive uh, focus? In many ways, yes. Economics didn't used to be its own discipline. It was instead called political economy, and it was something that philosophers did. So Adam Smith was thought of in his time as a philosopher, and his best friend was David Hume, who was quite plainly a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And they were unashamedly normative, that is, thinking not just about what is, not just thinking about questions about markets as purely technical questions, but also situating with them within much grander, bigger questions about moral philosophy, or in Smith's case, moral sentiments and taste and how human society really should be run. So as I think of things, 
the way I teach PPE, philosophy, politics, economics, harkens back to a, a, a predisciplinary era where economics was less technical or less purely technical and more integrated with other nearby social sciences or humanities disciplines, especially philosophy. That's at least how, how I think of things. Now, this is controversial. If you talk yeah. to somebody with a PhD in economics, they may not even recognize what Adam Smith did as the same thing as what they're doing now. They're building fancy models with differential equations and lots and lots of calculus. Adam Smith didn't do that. So maybe they're doing fundamentally different kinds of things. Hard to say, but I like the old way. Hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so I want to talk about kind of philosoph philosophical inquiry and money and value. So how does the concept of money intertwine with philosophical inquiries about things like value, ethics, human behavior, especially within sort of societal frameworks? Maybe it's good to start by just noticing money. Money is classically defined as a medium of exchange. And a medium is something that other stuff moves in. And it's easy to look at the other stuff but miss the thing in which they move. So think about sound traveling through the air. If you didn't slow down and think about it, you might not notice the air in which the sound is propagated. So also a fish in water. As we were saying just before this, the show started, fish don't see the water. What the hell is water? Uh, and that, that classic David Foster Wallace piece. So money is a medium of exchange, and it's easy to miss. But I think there are a lot of important questions that arise once you sort of uh, shift the focus. So I think of it as a camera shifting the plane of focus. All of a sudden, you're looking not at the background but the foreground. Now you're shifting what the foreground is. And all of a sudden, we see this thing that we're using to do trade, to do exchange. But what is it? So there's one question, and there's... What should it be? What sorts of things should we use as money? And who gets to decide? And who should make money if anybody makes money at all? That is not making money as in drawing a salary, but making money as in producing that medium of exchange. So these are questions that are elusive until you do that shift of focus. And then I think they become quite interesting and quite pressing in part because they draw on moral philosophy, but also monetary economics and the design of institutions. So that, that really does bring together philosophy, politics, and economics. Yeah, I think quite often as well, people can miss, I guess, the um, the creation of currency or money. Um, they, they kind of don't realize that obviously there's a time before we had the, the, the pound over here in the UK or the dollar in, in, in America or Singapore, Singapore dollar. So th there are sort of these, these things that we use to, to pay for items, but obviously we can wind the clock back before that and we can look at other different forms of money that have come into existence and kind of there are sort of obviously prehistoric almost forms of money that we can then begin to look at like could be uh, shells or salts or uh, rocks that people divide up depending on kind of who has what within the tribe so i think it might be really helpful actually to kind of i this is kind of going off script a little bit but also i think probably quite helpful for the, for the listener especially to to have an overview of kind of if money kind of predates society, because I kind of think there could be an argument which says that society can't function without some sort of a means of exchange, a sort of middle ground between goods and services. So would you mind kind of giving us an overview of kind of how that began to shift and create potentially societies, if, if I'm not putting words in your mouth there? I actually have a question for you first. Sure. You're right. The philosophy of money is thought of as this weird thing. If people hear the words, they're not quite sure what it means. You know, philosophy, religion, the study of religion and the arguments for and against existence of God, things like that. Philosophy money is a bit strange. Uh, what drew your interest to this? Why did you pick me to talk about philosophy of money with you? Um, so uh, your friend with uh, a friend of mine, uh, Joshua Rasmussen, uh, one of the main reasons he speaks very highly of you and he's spoken about you in other areas too. So I began to do a bit of research on you and realized that you'd spoken about philosophy of money. I thought, I, mean, I need to get this guy on. Um, obviously watched a few of your other shows that you've been on um, and then kind of realized that you've got a very articulate way of speaking. So hence why I wants to have you on. But I guess kind of prior to even starting the show and, and the show before this as well, um, I think I began to realize that the money that I was holding was losing value and losing value quickly. And we've especially seen that kind of in, in more recent years. Was it post COVID? I, 
that this happened to you or you'd been thinking about this for a while before that? Yeah. Yeah. This was literally COVID. I was locked down. I was in this room. Um, I was, you know, had more time than I realized and was on YouTube looking at stuff and didn't want to just watch pointless videos about stuff that doesn't really matter, like memes or whatever. I wanted to begin to educate myself. So I picked up a couple of books. Like I picked up, um, human action by Ed Ludwig von Mises. Uh, if I said his name right there, probably not. Anyway, um, picked up his book, which is like a massive magnum opus uh, on sort of kind of uh, human action and value creation and uh, and exchange and kind of read as much of it as I could whilst trying to understand it at the same time and then watching videos to kind of get my head around it and realizing basically that there is this um, entire different economic framework, the Austrian school of economics that I wasn't even aware was a thing. I didn't realize that our monetary policy was called a fiat monetary policy. Didn't even know what fiat meant. Um, and it means kind of by decree or by rule, I think, um, going back to the Roman times. And yeah, basically began to realize there's this entire realm that I just take for granted when I get my paycheck, I pay into my pension, I pay for food, I clothe my children, whatever it is. But all of this is kind of coming from something else that's deeper down. And I began mm. to realize essentially that I needed to understand what this was. Uh, is it a good foundation for us to blossom as a society into the future? Or are there cracks that are visible and obvious? And I kind of think the more the more I've explored it, the more harrowing it's become. Um, mm. So I kind of wanted to kind of basically have this conversation as a way to explore it myself again and see if the things I've, I've read and thought about and watched are correct, but also to kind of give the viewer and listener the opportunity to also realize that there is water they're swimming in the analogy we use at the start uh that they probably aren't aware of although in the current sort of climate with uh you know kind of inflation etc they probably are a little bit more aware of it than they were a couple of years ago but still it's very easy just to not notice and to continue on so yeah that's what got me into it anyway hmm. there are these keystone questions that we sometimes find that unlock not answers but new questions and money contains a number of those so it sounds like you stumbled into one of those keystone questions, you tugged on the stone and then a bunch of rocks started falling down and you're trying to put it back together and build, rebuild your arch. Weird analogy that's maybe, it. but no, that's uh, it. <laughs> things, things start to unravel and reveal weird new questions that need answers. That, that's what it often feels like at least. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's, um, it's strange how things begin to, to tilt and peter. Uh, and you begin to realize that you've got so many, so many more questions you want answers to. And I think that's the growth of wisdom really is realizing that you ask a question to explore an area and that area expands and you might have more questions than original, but actually your knowledge has grown with that, even though you might have more mm. questions and you begin to kind of see this sort of blossoming thing come about. Cause I reckon a lot of people will see, you know, a podcast like this titled the philosophy of money and be like, well, I don't need to know about that. I understand money. But actually when you begin to get into the nuances and the details, you begin to see that it's such a rich landscape. Uh, there's so much to explore. There's so many kind of hills to go off and wander in or valleys to try and get out of. Um, it's, it's quite exciting. But I think as well, a lot of people find their own camps in this space quite quickly. Uh, they're either kind of in the fiat camp or they're in the sort of hard money camp. And we'll get to those terms in due course, listener uh, and viewer, don't worry. But uh, you kind of see this also, um, yeah, I guess the, the sort of divisions and the siloing, sadly, as well within the space. Um, but we can get into that later on. I think it'd be good to come back now to this idea of sort of um, the creation of societies or currency and money to kind of help societies blossom. So I guess I'm trying to understand whether societies came first and money was the tool they used, or as I think is probably the case, but I might be wrong, monies were introduced to help societies become actual societies, the little groups and tribes, etc. They use these kind of common exchanges with other tribes and these things start blossoming into societies. I don't know, but obviously money is fundamental to how we live and work. And I feel like it must have started somehow, but I'm trying to work out it's a little chicken and egg problem, which came first. I don't know if you can shed any light on that. This is a vexing topic for anthropologists of money. And there's a selection effect that is in effect when studying the relevant evidence. And here's my take on how that goes. Money is a, is a social technology. It allows us, or it consists in coordinating. So you and I want to trade. You have coconuts, I have bananas. I want your coconuts, but you don't want my bananas. Okay, so if, if, if you wanted my bananas, they would just trade one for one or one for two and we're done. But what if you don't want what I have to offer? Be very nice if I had something to offer that you know you could give to anyone else to get what you really wanted. We call that money. 
In order for money to fill that role, though, we have to coordinate and not all, but at least enough of us select the same thing to use as our medium of exchange. So that third party needs to, like you and I, be using the same thing as money. So let's say it's shells. They need to accept shells in return from you. So I, I give you a shell, you give me the coconut, and then you use that shell to buy what you really wanted. So it's a coordination game. And if we all cooperate, we all win. If they're defectors, then uh, they don't win, or non-cooperators. So money is a social technology that allows us to coordinate. Now here's the problem with, with the anthropological evidence. Societies that don't take advantage of social technologies like that tend not to last. They tend not to have written records. They tend not to have been large, prosperous empires. And so whatever evidence there may have been of what they were like disappears quickly because there's such a strong comparative advantage. So consider, maybe this is an analogy, human beings or proto-humans, uh, early primate, you know, somewhere in between other primates and humans in our evolutionary history who couldn't speak. What will we know about their social organization compared to the ones who could speak, much less those who could write? Not much. Writing, writing is a fundamental social technology. Language is. So is money. But this confounds the anthropology and the history of money in some pretty important ways. Not always easy for people to spot the way this works, but there's a kind of evidential filtering, at least in, in my view. So we don't actually know what came first, society or money. It might just be one and the same thing that society is, conventions of coordination among which are words. So we coordinate to agree that this word means that thing and that this shell represents that amount of value, and so on. So it might just be that that's what society is. It's conventions that sustain this kind of helpful and advantage-conferring coordination. So that's a long way of saying I can't answer your question, and I think the people who say they can are actually fibbing a bit about what the evidence shows because there's an in-principle reason to think that we don't have access to some of the most important evidence, which would be to, let's say, view side by side evidence of what life was like for a tribe with money versus one without. I don't think we know the answer to that question because money presents a people group with such a decisive advantage in terms of their ability to actually have non-barter trade. Hmm. So th so this is maybe one helpful thought to have when reading something like David Graeber, the great late great anthropologist of money, who wrote a monstrous book that I've only read little bits of. It's Debt, the First 5,000 Years. And I think this is something that Graeber misses, in fact, and many who follow him when thinking about the history of money have missed, that there are evidential filters in place. Now, I think you, you like to think about the philosophy of religion, is that right? In, yeah, in yeah, previous, possibly. So maybe you're familiar with the fine-tuning argument. I am indeed, there are, yeah. There are evidential filters in play there that are in effect when thinking about the firing squad case. Perhaps you remember that from fine tuning mm -hmm. discussions you've had. Uh, the, is it worth sketching it for the, for the listener? So the fine tuning Oh, case. no, it's just, just a random connection that I thought you might okay. find useful. Uh, yeah. if, if anybody's interested, uh, you can look up things like the anthropic principle. And yeah. these evidential filters are in place in many different areas. And if you don't notice them, it's really easy to just start making bold conclusions on the basis of evidence that isn't there. But hmm. the fact that the evidence isn't there is actually predicted by a very different hypothesis. So you just you need to be careful with this. You can tell maybe this is like a pet peeve of mine when thinking about this stuff. <laughs> no, it's helpful. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I'd, I'd encourage the listener or viewer to, to check out the sort of uh, firing squad analogy with the fine tuning side of stuff, because that's a really interesting one. Something that um, Dostoevsky actually ex experienced kind of partly. Um, he wrote a book called The Idiot. I'm just going to go on a little spiel here. Apologies. He wrote a book called The Idiot, uh, which is his reflections on what it would be like to think that tomorrow was going to be gone because you're going to be killed, but realize you survived and you would live um, enjoying every moment and almost like an idiot to people. And the story goes mm -hmm. that uh, he was uh, put into a prison in Siberia because he'd been into sort of a, kind of a political uh, party or view or a kind of socialism that was kind of quelled. So he was put into this prison and because he was slightly noble or within the sort of kind of um, uh, uh, noble areas of, of the Russians, um, he essentially was 
lined up they put guns to everybody and then at the last minute somebody ran in saying stop 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 and so the firing squad never got to fire but uh, anyway i found that that to be really interesting you managed to write a book and all that anyway massive side point so we're kind of talking about money things like shells or salt or these rocks or whatever it is uh, as things that people can use as mediums of exchange the ways that people can exchange for uh, goods and services um there are kind of a few properties that money tends to have i'll give a few but then i'd love you to kind of fill, fill them in if that's okay so there's obviously the needs to be um divisible it needs to be durable it needs to be able to obviously go over a long distance uh, kind of transportable is probably the best term to use um what, what is it that makes money money like does it have to have these sort of um not just aesthetic but kind of um like kind of tangible properties that enable it to actually become money because obviously people could just use leaves or whatever and that would wouldn't work very well because they'd wither and die in, in no time at all so it feels like there has to be something that makes money money but also it's very easy to see things like salt or potentially shells being quite easily coerced and, and manipulated as they were so how does that all feed together Andrew? Big, big question apologies it might be useful to distinguish the question of what makes what properties make something money from what properties make something good money. So mm. let's focus on that first question, just what makes something money. My own view is rather simple. It's just that it is commonly used as a medium of exchange or commonly accepted. And in this way, money is a functional kind. It is what it does. And specified only in that very thin way there's a sense in which just about anything could be money. Leaves could be used. Now, that leads us to the other, maybe more interesting question, which is what properties make something useful or good as money? And then I think we have to look at money's other roles and also ask, useful for whom? Is it useful for those who are exchanging? Is it useful for some third party? Is it useful because of positive externalities enjoyed by not those who are transacting the money, but somewhere else, and so on. And these these are big questions. Now, you identified a few properties. Maybe another one that's uh, good to put on the table is recognizability, which is that it's cheap to tell whether something is money or not of the relevant kind. And this is one reason why gold has historically been such a powerful monetary mean. It's that it's cheap and quick and fairly easy, especially after Archimedes, to tell whether something is gold. You can weigh it, and you can even feel it in your hands. If you've handled enough gold, you know, okay, this tiny little coin should actually be quite heavy compared to a tiny little coin made of copper or to a rock or to, mm, actually, you know, now, now we have access to things like tungsten, which has a fairly similar specific density to gold. But, you know, you handle a lot of gold. You can actually tell that pretty cheap. And if you're suspicious, you bite it, you conduct electricity with it, you see if it bends easily, and uh, you even drop it in some water and see how much it displaces, and then you, you get its density. So this, despite that, it sounds like a fancy procedure, but in terms of verifying or recognizing that something is money, that's actually pretty cheap. For the monies that we used most often, that recognizability is achieved just by having materials and ink and stamping devices and security devices that are expensive to forge, but easy to look at and to sort of immediately verify that it's real. If you've handled American money, you know what it smells like. You know that it feels different than regular wood paper. It's cotton. If you've handled UK money, you know it has this plasticky feel. There's the bit, you hold it up to the light. You sort of know what the queen's supposed to look like. You're good to go. In just a few seconds, at least you'll have a very close approximation to whether it's good or not. Okay, so I'm rambling now, but recognizability is an important feature of money. You mentioned portability, divisibility. Yeah. Why, why does divisibility yeah. matter? So I think divis divisibility, like if you had, um, say, a single gold bar and that's all you had, you'd have to kind of build up um, your own resources um, to trade with the person that has the... So say I'm an apple seller and they want to buy apples, I'd have to give them a gold bar a gold bar worth of apples um, or vice versa or whatever it is we're trying to exchange. There's a lot of apples. There's a lot of apples and those apples are going to go off quite quickly. But if I just want to walk down the road whilst eating an apple, I want one apple. 
Um, I'm aware that you cannot currently buy an apple with an ounce of gold, but uh, once upon a time that was probably quite possible. You would get a little bit of gold and that gold would buy you a, an item or, or something. And it was uh, you, basically it was able to become small enough for an everyday purchase and that was really useful. Um, so that's kind of why I think divisibility is quite an important key element of a, of a good money. Let's go back to the bananas coconuts case. There's actually two problems in that case. It might be that you actually do want the bananas that I have to offer, and I do want your coconuts, but they don't trade at the ratio of one to one, or they don't trade in whole number ratios, and we don't wish to cut them up. It would be very nice to have something else we could trade that could be cut up, like gold coins that could be melted down, or like dollar bills that could be exchanged for pennies, and so on. So yeah, uh, that, that I, th I think focusing on that property helps us see there's actually two problems that money resolves. It's not just the problem of coincident wants, it's the problem of coincident quantities. And both are resolved with a good money that's highly divisible. Now there, there's a standard list of properties. Do you want to go through some of the other ones? Do you I think, think it would be, be helpful useful? if you're happy to, yeah. I'm not sure I could recite them all off the top of my head. So we have recognizability, divisibility, portability, durability, so it doesn't rot easily. So the Leafs example that we've already discussed fails yeah. on uh, durability. But gold doesn't react to anything, so it's highly, highly, highly durable. I want to invite you to join our community on Locals. There is a range of free and supporter-only benefits to check out. On Locals, you can ask guest questions, access the reading plan to prepare for upcoming conversations, get early access to all the full-length video and audio versions of each episode, and meet like-minded followers of the show. The link is in the description, and I hope to see you there. Others? I, I, know there's, I know there's more, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure I could recite them all. There's maybe seven typical one in total yeah i can't either i think you've you, i think you've hit the main ones that yeah that i'm that i'm aware of anyway i mean what, what kind of a little a little tangent talking about kind of um recognizability of money um I've, I've heard it said but i often wonder if it's true that when you the sort of term sound money has come about because when when one drops a gold coin it makes a very specific sound and you can tell from that that it's gold i don't know if that's just a sort of a, a nice anecdote or whether it's actually true um, yeah, that doesn't sound true to me. I think it's just derived from the the notion of sound meaning good. Like a sound argument is a good argument. That sound advice means it's good advice. So sound money is good money. I, I suspect, but you know, we we don't have to not know. We could Google this. Maybe yeah, later on. Over. We'll do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was always wondering who was dropping gold coins. Like, if that's something you do, something gives you money, you throw it on the floor. It just sounds a bit weird. You know, um, I've handled so little gold in my life, I couldn't tell you what it sounds like when it's dropped. Yeah. I, I don't even have a gold. My, my wedding band isn't gold. It's, it's tungsten carbide. So I, I couldn't tell you. Maybe. I've got, do, I've, do, you I've have, got, do you have gold? Is this, is this something that's... i gold ring on at the moment. Okay. You have gold in your life, at least a little I'll bit. Drop it on the table and see what it sounds like. Okay. It's going to sound okay. like metal hitting a table. <laughs> that's, that's the issue, right? It could be any right. metal. Um, I don't drop enough gold to know. That's the issue. Um, that's funny. Um, we, we've mentioned, um, kind of, uh, fiat money and we've mentioned sort of the Austrian school of economics. Um, there's obviously the kind of Keynesian school of economics, which kind of fits within, um, the fiat monetary policies that we see kind of across the world in general. I kind of want to dive into these. Um, and I'm aware that we can kind of most podcasts probably hammer the Keynesian school of economics quite heavily and kind of glorify the Austrian school of economics. Um, as much as possible, I just want to kind of just explore the two camps without trying to add any bias into those. I'm saying this for myself more than you, mm -hmm. Andrew, don't worry. Um, so I guess to kind of start off with, let's kind of strip sort of the ethical kind of segments of the questions out. So um, it'd be good to understand what the Keynesian kind of school of economics is who Keynes was, what he was proposing, when he was proposing it. Um, and then we can obviously compare that to the Austrian school um, afterwards. John Maynard Keynes was one of the great economists of the 20th century. And he was active in and around Cambridge, and especially Cambridge University from perhaps 
1915 through 1945, 1950s, something like that. So the early half of the 20th century. And he was surrounded by an enormously interesting and productive group of people who together were making a bunch of new intellectual discoveries and basically defining some new fields. So his friend Frank Ramsey was inventing or discovering decision theory. Another friend of theirs, Wittgenstein, was an important analytic philosopher of the early 20th century. There was Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore. And then there's John Maynard Keynes, who in some ways invented large swaths of economics, the academic discipline as we know it today. There's a number of pieces that, that uh, to that puzzle that put him in that position. He actually wrote quite a bit, and when people hate on Keynes, I often wonder how much of Keynes they've actually read, because he changed his mind, and he wrote across a number of topics. So early on in his career, for example, in the 20s, he wrote some really amazing stuff about how inflation was dangerous and socially dangerous and disruptive. That is, it was a tool of repression that could enhance the powers of authorities and also disrupt social fabric. So, okay, he, he wrote about that. He also was a an interesting futurologist who made some, in some ways, goofy and in some ways prescient predictions about the coming ginormous rise in productivity that we saw roughly from World War II onwards. So he saw that a, a wall, a huge curve of productivity was coming in. That is roughly how much stuff we can produce per hour of human input. And he saw that capital formation was happening. Population growth is going to happen. He didn't foresee World War II, but he saw still the shape of the curve that it was going up. And then he made some predictions about what's going to happen in this, this classic essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And he wrote this in 1928. But perhaps you know what happened in 1929. That, that curve uh, was disrupted by the Great Depression. But it actually picked back up after World War II. So he, he was a, a, an interesting, if flawed, futurologist. And then perhaps most importantly for your question here is he's more or less the inventor of macroeconomics as we know it. And it's not always easy to define macroeconomics versus micro. Perhaps the thing that he invented or discovered, the technique that allowed macroeconomics to exist as we don't know, is by building models that have aggregate variables. And what that means is that there's this variable in the model that isn't just one person's utility function or one person's desire for something or a preference for this over that. Instead, it's supposed to be aggregate. It, it combines all utility into one or all demand or all supply or the supply of all money. And what this allows uh, Keynesians to do is to make these models that relate vast aggregations of human behavior across all industries, all places, and then see how they relate to each other. And the models just basically, you know, uh, that, that these two variables are equal or that this one plus this one equals that one or there's a ratio and and so on so that, that's maybe a core technique that he invented and then he used that to theorize about how government spending and money creation among other things relate to economic growth and the idea there is that government spending can in fact spur growth and that it's important for money supply to grow alongside growth and productivity. So as an economy grows, you need the money, money supply to grow as well. That's one key idea that he articulated and basically gifted to economics some of the technical tools required to even state the idea. Now, once you've noticed that tool, I think you might have a lot of questions about it. You're like, does this actually make sense to add up your demand plus my demand plus everyone else's, and then call it aggregate demand, and to say that we need aggregate demand to go up for the economy, you know, the economy uh, to be better, as if there is this one thing that is the economy. But that's kind of what macroeconomics is about. It's about building those models that talk about everything all at once, all people, what they want and what they have, you know, supply and demand, and how they relate to each other. Now, you obviously have some knowledge of Keynes, and you, you have an angle you want to take on this question. So I, I like to hear what, what is your background uh, picture 
of who Keynes was and what his intellectual contributions were? Big questions. Okay, Sam, better pull your socks up. Um, I, so I've, I've come to Keynes from understanding the Austrian school of economics. So I've read about him and heard about him in a very negative way. Hmm. I'm aware that that's heavily affected my view of him and that there are people that I know and respect who, who say a lot of positive things about um, his kind of intellectual contributions. I think kind of it, it, it feels like, as you already mentioned, people kind of go on, on earlier work of Keynes rather than later work of Keynes. You mentioned there that kind of um, basically that the monetary supply should grow as the um, as the economy grows, but as, as the population grows as well. But then he also kind of that's going to be fire inflation. We can't just kind of create things out of thin air without inflating that, that system, unless it's linked to a hard money, which we'll, we'll get to in, in a little bit. Um, but obviously kind of, you also mentioned, he thinks the idea of inflation is a negative thing, kind of writing this later on, I believe. Um, so other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Other way around. Okay. Sorry. So there, there kind of seems to be this sort of, um, I, I, I guess view of him, which is heavily negative, but yet at the same time, kind of, he's provided this sort of um, framework for the fiat monetary policies we have now to kind of springboard from. And I think sometimes people struggle to differentiate between kind of where we are today as a society globally, um, you know, as, as the whole world, everything, every country is on a, a fiat monetary policy of some sort or another um, compared to kind of, you know, this person back in the 1900s, writing these sort of policies from, all these ideas from Cambridge University, as you mentioned. So I, I don't know, I think, I, I don't know tons about him. My sort of question was going to go into sort of a, um, the ethical principles regarding wealth distribution, charity and societal welfare. Um, but I remove that from the question because I think that's just stepping us down the road that I've heard before. Um, so that was, that was the angle, you mentioned the angle, that was the angle I was thinking about taking, but I'm not sure that does justice uh, to kind of exploring kind of Keynesian economics. I don't know, what, what are your thoughts? I, I do have one ethical extension, or maybe we can move into political philosophy from here. Once, sure. once we have this idea of a macroeconomic model with these big aggregate variables, I think it's tempting for technocratic types and think here of some guy who's always been very smart and very successful and wealthy in his life. Maynard's was a very successful investor and successful at every intellectual endeavor he tried. Okay, you're on top of the game. You're baron. You're English royalty. You've taught at Cambridge. You're a gentleman in, around town in London. And you have this model that relates these variables to each other. And let's say you want one of them to go up. Well, I think it's tempting to look at the model and think of it as a recipe for manipulation, that if we want this outcome, okay, then we have to change something else. We have to boost demand, or we have to cut supply, or increase monetary supply, or change interest rates, or we need to boost employment by increasing spending, uh, of, of government spending in particular. And so I, I think there's maybe not a necessary link, but there's at least a strong contingent link between using these models and then the desire to tinker. The people who invent these models and talk about them tend to be the technocratic types who then want to tinker with an economy to improve things by messing with these little variables, boost this, cut that, in order to achieve some outcome. And this can be dangerous in a number of ways. And maybe now would be a good time to talk about the Austrian school, because the Austrians, you might characterize them very broadly as anti-tinkerers. They don't think that you can improve things from the outside if you're not a party to a transaction by tinkering with it. So maybe a place to start there is just to think about the benefits of trade, fundamental economic idea. And one of the weirdest things is that just by moving stuff around from you to me, let's say I just exchange uh, let's go back. To, let's, let's say there's no money involved. It's just bananas and coconuts. I have a banana. You want a coconut. I would rather have your coconut than have my banana and vice versa for you. So here's something almost magical that can happen. If we trade the one banana for the one coconut, you are better off. I am better off. We didn't increase the amount of stuff in the world. We didn't produce wealth in that sense. And yet we produced wealth 
if wealth is just the stuff that can make us happier. So you're better off, I'm better off, and in aggregate, we're better off. So trade is kind of magical. Now ask this. There's an epistemic side to this as well as a metaphysical side. Let's look first at the epistemic side. Who's in a better position to know whether you'd be better off from that trade if you took it? Here's a natural thought. This is the one the Austrians have. It's you. I don't know your desires. Lord Keynes doesn't know your desires. He doesn't know better than you whether you'd rather have the banana or the coconut. You do. And so for us both to achieve that great good of both being better off, mutual gain, there's no losers here. There's winners only. You let people subjectively value things and then freely exchange them. Very natural thought. Of course, there's lots of qualifiers we can add. Maybe people can be wrong about this kind of stuff. But that is one premise of the Austrian school of economics. So, so-called Austrian because a number of its proponents and founders were Austrians. In particular, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, and Murray Rothbard. Uh, von Mises and Hayek both fled Austria uh, around the time of the rise of Nazi Germany. They're sometimes besmirched as fascist sympathizers or something like that. And you know if somebody says that, that they're basically going to be wrong about everything else they say about these guys. Because uh, they fled Nazi Germany and then Hayek spent the rest of his life trying to figure out, to diagnose what went wrong, what he called this great wickedness in the Third Reich and how to fix it. What Hayek thought went wrong was the arrogance of central planning, the idea that some third party could decide for us what would make us better off. You want my banana, I want your app, uh, I want your coconut, and somebody else says, no, 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 you shouldn't want the coconut, you should want a speaker instead, or you should want some coffee. Imagine the arrogance required to do that. Now, who, who might be so arrogant? Well, maybe Lord Keynes and his friends who've, you know, had, had a long, illustrious careers of being smarter than everybody else around them or thinking that they are. So that's one important point of difference, both in vibes and maybe in the letter of the law as well, between the Austrians and people who are more into central planning. They just don't think that third parties to a transaction are in a position to even know what's better off for other people. And that, that fundamental premise puts you in a, in a positions you to have a number of other views that are broadly free market in their orientation. That is allowing people to trade because trade is one of these things that just creates wealth, almost magically, almost out of nothing. But that is a a really great way to make people happier. You just allow them to mutually benefit each other. So that is not necessarily the canonical definition of the Austrian school. That's what I think of as one of their key premises though. Now we we we've strayed we strayed from money into trade, yeah. but let's let's bring it to money. Money isn't fundamentally different from other goods in this respect. It's something useful that we want in order to use for its purpose, which is to be a medium of exchange. Now, with that in mind. Is there a good reason to not let people select individually or together without state intervention, say, what to use as money? The Austrians will say no. People who like central planning will say, "Mm, no, no, maybe there's some third party who needs to decide what you and I use as money when we transact. Maybe for other reasons, maybe because of positive or negative externalities for using given money, or maybe to benefit themselves. There's the kind of suspicious cynical interpretation that those who wish to control others might have strong reason to get others to use the money they produce. That that puts it in a kind of conspiratorial way. But maybe the way someone like Keynes would put it is that central planners need to be in a position to boost or cut aggregate demand or aggregate supply or aggregate monetary supply. And if they're not producing the money, they can't do that. And so it's important that we all use the money that's produced by them, the central planners, and that they can control the supply or the supply dynamics of by, for example, controlling interest rates, which uh, controls how much new money is produced uh, with new uh, lending, whether from a commercial or central bank. 
So these actually fit together, uh, is what I'm saying. The, the fundamental vibe of the Austrian school, which is free market and its orientation, and then the denial of that on the part of central planners. Now, the way I've described this, this is more like, uh, this, this is how someone like Hayek might describe it. I think von Mises would put things a bit differently. But uh, for, for what it's worth, I like Hayek better. I think he's by far the more interesting thinker of those two titans of the Austrian school. But you, you read all of On Action or a big chunk of it? Uh, over the last it's, few years, I've read I don't know, chunks of four, four inches, three and a half. It's, it's ridiculous. Huge. Yeah, it's absolutely massive. And, and and kind of weird that you mentioned that they kind of fled uh, Nazi Germany. Somebody bought it for me uh, as a gift. Oh, sorry, the Nazis invading uh, Austria. Um, someone bought it for me as a gift, and they gave it over to me. It just says Human Action, and it's like this sort of. Um, I don't know, really sort of Aryan-esque cover where there's these people kind of building a house but they've all got blonde hair. Somebody was like, is mm. this book okay? I was like, I promise you, it's not It's not anything dodgy. Um, but it's just amusing it's that they've used it's that not. as the cover. Um, yeah. Yeah, I read, I read a, a good portion of it. I mean, to be fair, I think it's distilled in many, many other books. I've been kind of working through um, uh, Lynn, uh, Lynn Alden. She's kind of a mm. well-known... Um, economist um if that's the right phrase uh, anyway she kind of speaks about kind of money and she's got a book called broken money which kind of goes through the whole story of money and kind of uh, how central banks for instance kind of came about and how we began to kind of have them underpinning kind of other banking systems and how it all feeds back into uh into different pots basically but yeah so i think even her book kind of distills the main points quite nicely mm. um but yeah yeah it was hardcore I don't remember lots of it because it was so hardcore. Um, it's very written in a very old style, which I sometimes enjoy just for the just for the nostalgia. I think. Yeah, and and he was old school in a number of ways. One of them was that he wasn't afraid to do philosophy. A lot of academic economists writing now either shy from doing philosophy or they do it without knowing it and thus don't do it very well, in my opinion. But von Mises was writing straight up epistemology of markets and straight up ontology of prices. You know, these are fields of philosophy as applied to, uh, to human exchange and human action under scarcity. So he, he was utterly unapologetic about that. Maybe one point of departure between him and me is he thought that economics was and should be a purely a priori discipline, which means that you can derive the pr correct principles of economics just by reflection alone. You just think about it and you'll see what the correct principles are. My own view is closer to what's called the Chicago School, which allows for interaction between intuition or theory and then empirical verification. So that's more the school of someone like Milton Friedman and the methods of people who trained at the University of Chicago from, let's say, the, the 40s through the 90s. So there, there's a, a methodological divide between both of those free market-ish schools in economics, and the Austrians are firmly a prioristic. Uh, I, I think it's great to have empirical evidence too, and that empirical evidence can actually refute economic theories. You can show that it's false. Von Mises thought that was actually impossible. That correctly done, you'll derive your theories from the principle of human action, which is that people act for reasons to achieve their ends. And, uh, well, I think... The steps can go wrong, and we can be empirically refuted, and then we work our way backwards and get a new theory and try on new intuitions. That's, that's a, a side of the Austrian school that, to me, is less plausible than the, the side I've already emphasized from Hayek and from the epistemic limits of central planners. Interesting. Okay. One of the, um, one of the sort of things we've touched on, I guess, is this idea of kind of... Um, I guess we could use the term free markets. Um, so if, if I speak out of turn here, uh, Andrew, please correct me when you when you follow up the, the question. But um, this idea of free markets is a market that isn't underpinned or coerced by any other entity, but actually, as we already mentioned, I can exchange my bananas for your coconuts uh, using a means of exchange if needed or just a direct trade if we have the right quantities of these substances. Um, this idea of kind of free markets, I think, it kind of feeds into what you mentioned about kind of individual liberty. And sort of libertarians tend to hold this view where we want the government to be as reduced as possible to be able to take care of sort of core components or core areas. 
Um, and then we kind of see that obviously not being the case in the sort of societies that we live in today, uh, especially in the US, Singapore or, or here in the UK. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is this idea of individual liberty, free markets is far from where we are right now. D do you kind of see that's where we started and where we could get to? Or has that always just been a dream held by Austrians in the School of Economics? Emphasis on markets as uniquely happiness generating is not unique to the Austrians. This is an insight that goes all the way back to Adam Smith. In fact, one of the central questions of his classic book, this this big tome he wrote that made him famous, it's called uh, something something Wealth of Nations. People just call it Wealth of Nations. There, there's more. They're like one of these old school long subtitles, if I recall correctly. But anyways, the central question is, whence the wealth of nations? Why are some nations wealthy and others not? And his answer was markets. And in particular, it's that fundamental dynamic of people being better off when they both mutually benefit from a trade. And then you add to that things like comparative advantage and so on. So that, that's not unique to the Austrian school. Uh, it's, it's an insight accepted by many different economists and kind of foundational to much of the discipline as we know it now. I do think that... My my own. I'm, I'm not. I'm I'm a lover of liberty, but I'm not libertarian. I think that, at least, within what we know of human experience, markets are at their best when there's still a state, because it's the state that enforces property rights. It's the state that enforces contracts, and those are the things. Those are the preconditions for safe, low cost, high certainty exchange, without. You know, there would be massive transaction costs if I had to have a bunch of hire a bunch of guys to have guns on you, making sure that you hand over the coconuts at the right time. No, no, we we outsource all of that. That's the state. So, uh, free markets are often sustained and enabled by states, but of course, states can go wrong, and they do. They often do. Maybe they inevitably do. So I see there being a a dynamic, maybe that's just an eternal oscillation between liberty and tyranny, that uh, we need a little bit of tyranny, that is a little bit of the state, to keep our shit together. Uh, too much? Revolution? <laughs> and you're back. Then you, you swing the pendulum to the other side. Now, obviously, that's a ridiculously simple view of human history, but I think we do see something like a cycle like that. And I, I wouldn't make any predictions on where we are in the cycle now, but I do believe that state authority has in many ways accelerated in our lifetime, and it's being enabled uh, technically by things like the Internet and cheap mass surveillance. And that's reason to think that the pendulum will accelerate in the direction of a state that is too large, that is too powerful, that is intervening too much and constricting human liberty. And uh, I guess... An inevitable consequence of that is something breaks and people don't like it and revolution. Now, nobody wants revolution in their time, I'm not predicting or asking for that. But I would guess that that dynamic is in effect across many human societies and places and times. Does, does that seem right to you? What do you think? The, the pendulum idea with liberty and uh, tyranny. I think if we... If we look again at Adam Smith and David Hume during their time, obviously there was a lot going on over in America at the time. Yeah, it was 1776 is when that's the publication yeah. date for Wealth of Nations. So yeah, yes, exactly crazy. at that time. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously you kind of see this 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 demand for liberty, for justice, for freedom, for to sh break off the shackles of the sort of empire's tyranny, the kind of England's empire, um, the Great British Empire. Um, when we were once great, um, and there's this sort of yeah, I think I think we see that played out time and time again. We could you know even go further on to sort of uh, looking at Rome or Greece or or Egypt or wherever, and you see these things expanding and rolling and growing, and then kind of being kind of um, overthrown and curtailed, and then you see them taking a very very long time to pull up the the, the piece again. Um, mm. It's very rare that you get something like the US. Usually you get a uh, sort of um, broken state, the French Revolution. Look what they got. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I mean that, that definitely rings bells um, as far as I can tell. But I don't know. You're, you're obviously going to be more familiar with uh, with that time period in the US. So could you give us a bit more of a, an, an insight into how you think that maybe played out there? Well, I think the Americans got fed up and they decided to self liberate and to reverse engineer the political philosophy required to legitimate that. And in some ways it required a little bit of reverse engineering, but in some ways the seeds for that was already there, uh, especially in the work of John Locke. So John Locke wrote his first and second treatises on government. And what he was trying to figure out was whether the glorious revolution of what, 1650 or so was justified. So uh, Oliver Cromwell, Charles I, beheading kings, and so on, could revolution be justified? And he thought the answer was at least sometimes yes. And the Americans, uh, 75 years later, are thinking about like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said it's sometimes okay. Are the conditions met? So at the time of the American Revolution, Locke's second treatise on government was the most widely or second most widely read piece of literature after the Bible in the American colonies. So that fermented for years, and finally they said enough is enough and threw off the chains. I mean, obviously I'm an American, you can tell from my accent, even though I live in Singapore. Uh, I'm an American, so I'm, I'm giving you the American version of the story. Cast off their chains, self-decolonized, and became the first great former English colony. Of course, Singapore is another great former English colony, but here we, weren't, uh, we didn't have to cast off the chains, chains so dramatically. I am... Um... I don't know. I kind of can't help but think we're kind of on this theme of um, American independence, and obviously you kind of look at the founding of the American monetary system. It's quite complicated. You've got things like I think they're called greenbacks, and you've got other forms of money that kind of you know one hyperinflated, one didn't inflate, then one obviously won out in, at the end of the day. But you know that's that's almost like a case study in this in this concept mm. of setting up a new economy and a new thing because obviously you're going to try and cut off the the English empire and build in your own system of your own wealth because that's what it's all about it's about you being independent and your own source of uh, of um of freedom basically so mm. i don't know kind of it, are there any other there, there's a money around? connection there in fact yeah, yeah. to especially in massachusetts so that's now an american state it was a commonwealth at the time one of the colonies and one of their maybe more unique complaints against England was not that there was too much money. It was not that the Bank of England created too many notes. It was that the Bank of England created too few notes. They actually had a divisibility problem. So the central bankers across the Atlantic were not producing reliable banknotes in sufficient quantity to allow trade to happen in a fast-growing economy. So you need a unit of account that can divide so you're not you know you can't just have everything be worth one pound or one buck or whatever it was so one of their demands was that the bank of england create more money and the bank of england said no and this actually led to a, a maybe you could call this punctuated equilibrium so you know there's these long periods of stasis in technology or in evolution and then there's some new selective pressure that creates an impetus for the invention of something new. So what they invented in Massachusetts was what we now know as pure fiat money. It's not a note that's convertible or redeemable for gold. It's a note that is accepted as a medium of exchange, accepted as valuable, though it has no intrinsic value and can't be redeemed for anything. They wanted more money. They wanted more notes because they had a divisibility problem. So they made some. Now, the invention of fiat money, uh, by the way, this version of the story, this is somewhat contentious in the history of money. It's been most recently told by Dror Goldberg, a really great monetary economist who teaches in Israel. And just this year, he published a book called Easy Money uh, with the University of Chicago Press that basically tells the story of, Ma of, of some Puritans in Massachusetts inventing fiat money as we know it. And then the disaster, well, a drawer thinks that it's like a lot of bad things happen as a result of that. But uh, also it solved a problem. They had a divis divisibility problem. They need more money. And their colonial masters w refused to produce enough money. So a new kind of money was born. And, well, that's what we have now. That's what's in my pocket right now. I don't know about yours. But uh, there are other kinds of money, too. If you're watching this, 
then I just wanted to let you know that you can access the same content in audio only form by subscribing via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Audible. In fact, you can search for The Socratic Sessions in your favorite podcast app. And whilst you're there, please leave a five-star review. It helps others to discover these conversations. All links are in the description. And thank you. Yeah, I mean, these days it's just it's just cards, isn't it? Lots and lots of plastic cards. That seems to be the way we're going. Um, yeah, we talk about paper money, but most money isn't even paper anymore. It's just bank deposits, bank balances, and a commercial bank, or even not even a bank. It's in a, a new bank or a bank-like thing like PayPal. Yeah. Or here we have PayLa and PayNow in Singapore. Okay. Yeah, it is fascinating, the kind of way we're going. And also kind of scary but I, I mean hopefully we can push into that towards the end i think i wanted to um i kind of have questions on wealth and and kind of materialism as well as gold we can touch on as well but i think mm. it might be helpful before we dive into those um and you know any any other questions you have or anything and if you want to take the conversation in any way you think would be more interesting then please please steer us as we go um but we've mentioned before sort of hard money and we've mentioned fiat money we kind of define what those are, but I wonder if it would be helpful because I don't know. I don't know whether you would want to class fiat money as soft money because obviously the opposite of hard money is soft mm. money. So it'd just be really helpful, I think, just to kind of iron those wrinkles out for us, Andrew, if that's okay, to help us just get our heads around those concepts. Here are two dimensions that it might be useful to identify when comparing monies. The first is marginal cost of production, and I say marginal because it's not just fixed cost of production but cost of production for a new unit. So let's think, first think about gold. Gold has a non-zero marginal cost of production. So even if you've paid your fixed costs, you have your gold digging devices, you have your mine set up, you still have to power those devices and dig further for the marginal unit, each new additional ounce that's unearthed. So there's a positive non-zero marginal cost for gold. Compare that to paper U.S. dollars. Now, of course, there's fixed costs with creating paper U.S. dollars. You have to have your money printer set up and your stamps and your plates and your ink. But let's say that's all set up. What's the marginal cost of producing a $10 note versus a $100 note, that extra $90 in face value? It's zero. All you do is switch out the plate from a $10 note plate to a $100 note plate. So that's one important dimension where fiat monies like the dollar differ from old school commodity monies like gold. Now, here's another dimension of difference, which is intrinsic value. Gold has intrinsic value, the way economists think about it, which just means that you can consume it, you can use it in some way other than just exchange. How do people use gold? Well, if you have a phone in front of you, as I do, there's some gold in there because it conducts electricity very, very well. Maybe you have a gold ring on, so you're using that as uh, something beautiful, People have used gold in that way for a long time. So gold has, in that sense, intrinsic value. Compare a $100 banknote, U.S. dollar. Does it have intrinsic value? Well, you can burn it and get a few calories of heat. That's about it. You can't really use it. So it has close to zero intrinsic value. So these two properties, when you put them together, that's what we now know as fiat money. It's money that isn't backed by a commodity like gold. It has... So it, uh, I, I first let's define it in terms of those two features. It has no intrinsic value, and it has a zero marginal cost of production. And furthermore, it can't be redeemed for something that has intrinsic value or that has a positive non-zero marginal cost of production. So some notes actually represent gold, and those would be not fiat money because you know as long as they're actually backed by gold, redeemable by gold, for gold. Uh, they, they wouldn't be fiat money in that sense. Gold has both intrinsic value and a non-zero marginal cost of production. Now, in recent years, what's really interesting to me is the emergence of a new kind of money, which actually combines features from both fiat and gold. And maybe Bitcoin is the best example of this new kind of money. Bitcoin has a positive marginal cost of production. It costs something to make more Bitcoins, and that's what Bitcoin miners do. So in that respect, it's like gold. And yet Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. You can't eat it. 
You can't live in it as with a house. Uh, it's, in fact, pure money, much like the U.S. dollar. It's valuable because somebody else wants it as for its exchange rather than use value. So Bitcoin is unique in that respect, or represents a unique and weird new kind of money. But fiat money, as we know it now, has neither of those features. And this makes it both very good and very bad, in my opinion. There are real trade-offs here. The um, the sort of kind of place that I think people view us as originally coming from was on a gold standard. I feel like gold also has um, kind of issues or problems that kind of come up um, from, I guess, historic perspectives. So there was something kind of called the gold standard, which many countries were on and they kind of left uh, for various reasons. And then there's a sort of big, um, I guess, a lot of sort of... Um, Libertarians would point at kind of 1971 as a crucial time when the US came off a gold standard definitively as well mm. and point to that as a sort of source of problems. But I kind of, I think it'd be good, you kind of mentioned Bitcoin as a uh, a good example of, of a hard money. It'd be really helpful as well to kind of, I think, explore kind of what gold is, how it functioned as a sort of base for money, for hard money, and kind of why why it wasn't good enough to kind of be something that kind of, I guess, governments and societies continued on with? This is a complicated question, and I think economists and historians of money are more agreed that gold was bad and that its fall was inevitable than they are about why. Now, my own view is that this is all kind of murky and that maybe gold's fall was not inevitable and that it wasn't so bad as the consensus view has it. But maybe we can first identify a respect in which gold is inferior compared to, heart, uh, to fiat monies as we know them. Gold is a commodity. Gold is heavy. It takes up space. And if you want to move a lot of value using gold, you got to move a bunch of really heavy metal. That turns out to be insecure, inconvenient, and expensive. Moving around a bunch of paper is super cheap. It's very convenient, and you can do it much more safely because you can compress all that value and not have to carry around you know, this huge, heavy suitcase of gold or whatever it is. So there's an advantage that fiat monies have over gold that maybe led them to win in monetary wars against gold if there's a kind of evolutionary competition. But... The, the scales aren't exactly even in this respect. It's not as though people are deciding for themselves what is a better money to use. There's a thumb on the scales, and maybe one, one of the thumbs on the scales is from those who would like to control the supply of money. They would like to be able to print money or to take money out of circulation, to control or manipulate or manage or centrally plan an economy by managing or controlling or planning money. And fiat money is much easier to do that with than gold. And maybe you can see that in both the, the positive and negative sides, that is producing money or taking it out of circulation. So how do you produce more gold? Well, you got to work for it. you got to start digging, bro. And you got to dig long and hard. That's expensive. Again, positive marginal cost of production. So if you want to increase the supply of money, you're going to have to put a ton of energy into that if the money is gold. Let's say the money is fiat money. You just print more of it. It's literally free to print more of it. Let's say you're going to print $1. Just change out the plate into a $10 plate or a $100 plate. Why not while we're at it? And for no marginal cost, you've created money with much higher face value. So if you want to manipulate the supply of money in the upwards direction, fiat money is much more convenient. Let's say you want to manipulate it in the downwards direction. Well, paper money... Uh, goes bad over time. You know, it degrades. It's fairly durable, but not infinitely durable, unlike gold, which is close to infinitely durable. And we can also, so money sort of, paper money naturally falls out of circulation in that respect. And when money is being created through lending, we can also slow the rate of the expansion of money just by raising interest rates, by making it more expensive to create new money in the form of uh, new loans, whether from a commercial or central bank. So for people wanting to manage money on either side of the equation, 
fiat money is so much more convenient. If everybody's convinced to accept it, then that's half the game. The other half of the game is just to be the one who gets to produce it, to be the central banker, let's say. And then you get to tinker with the economy. You get to manipulate interest rates and thereby manipulate things like employment or aggregate demand. And if you think that you can make an economy better by intervening and manipulating it, well, then this is one of your main toolbox, uh, tools in your toolbox is just to be a central banker with those kinds of tools. So uh, someone who's of that mood, they're really going to like fiat money and they're really going to hate gold. Hmm. And Bitcoin too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You cannot manipulate Bitcoin in that way. So Bitcoin no, is, is in that respect packed. closer to gold. Yeah, pegged at 21 million, isn't it, I think? Um, There's so, a supply cap for Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's it. Sorry, supply cap of Bitcoin. And um, so I think it's often been stated, I don't know whether it's true, whether fiat money won in the war between kind of gold and fiat money because of war. So various countries and uh, removed themselves from gold standards at times of crisis and potentially proposed to go back onto gold standards and either never did or did temporarily. Um, because of this very reason, they needed to increase their resources and they needed more money to do that. And therefore having it pegged to something meant they needed to get more gold to then have more money. Um, but actually they couldn't do that mm. easily. So they, they diverged from gold into just straight fiat money um, to be able to pay for wars. World War One would be an example or uh, wars before that and after that as well. So do you think it was, do you, do you think that narrative's correct, that it was times of crisis that have caused countries to move away from a gold standard and then just never come back to it? I don't think I have a firm grip on the history to answer that question. And for me, when I read histories of money that try to answer that question, they're also, they strike me as often deeply ideological. So it's a gold bug right in the history or it's someone who clearly has a pro-central bank axe to grind. So this is actually somewhat vexed for me that I can't tell who's telling the truth on this one. So maybe I shouldn't opine until I've studied it further. Sorry. I, I, I actually don't have strong opinions about uh, how exactly this happened, whether it's inevitable, and how to think about those cycles. So you're correct, they're, they're these cycles of uh, nation states going on the gold standard, going off it in times of war, and then going back on it. It's not obvious to me why they would have gone back on it, given the, let's say, gold bug narrative, but they did. So I just don't know how to think about that myself. Sorry, totally unhelpful, but that's where I'm at. No. I just need to learn more on this one, I think. No, that's fair enough. Okay, let, let's talk about sort of, um, I guess, philosophical and economic cycles then. So, there's this idea that kind of different philosophical ideologies kind of come in to address different things. So at the moment, people are probably more aware of inflation. They're looking at different philosophies that kind of mm. or looking through different philosophical lenses to understand inflation. And that can then catapult us, say, in the next 30 years into different economic cycles, purely based on our research and our understanding and our reasoning. And I kind of wonder whether that can be tracked back through history, probably not in a clear way, um, but it'd be interesting to kind of get your take on whether you think philosophical trends impact and create economic cycles, whether the term economic cycles is even correct, I'm not sure. So yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Andrew. This is a big question, and it's an instance of an even bigger one. The even bigger question is, how do material forces interact with ideas in human history? Some people think that ideas are in the driver's seat, that it's philosophical ideas about revolution, for example, that led to the American Revolution. There's the so-called materialists, on the other hand, who think that it's all material forces. It's just economic conditions that lead people to do stuff, and then they invent the ideas after the fact. What's probably closer to the truth at this very, very abstract level is that they're both active in different ways in different places at different times. And sometimes the ideas really are in the driver's seat, that this new idea takes hold and drives people to do new weird things. And sometimes it's material forces. It's like scarcity or starvation or war that lead people to invent the ideas required to do what they're going to do anyways. So that is the very, very abstract characterization of what you're, you're asking. And then maybe the 
the more narrow, close version of the question is in business cycles or more local, let's say 30 year time frame or 10 year time frame, how do I, ideas interact with those business cycles or conditions? Let's say an inflationary uh, spike and then it's uh, hopefully uh, coming back down again, things like that. Uh, here too, I, I guess I would say that there's causation in both directions. And I think the the one example we have of one causal direction is just the only, the story you already gave earlier in our conversation. Material conditions changed around you. You're locked down in COVID and you're seeing inflation and it leads you to start thinking deeply about some ideas. And then these ideas have started to change your behavior on the basis of these new convictions or questions or suspicions you have you're starting to think more deeply about money and maybe even changing your, your behavior. Maybe you're using a different form of money to save now, or you're interested in alternative monies to just the standard. That's uh, kind of the easy, obvious thing in front of you, their British pound. So the causation goes probably in both directions in really complicated ways. And I'm more certain about small local cases of just individuals than I am about how these forces work across big spans of time and big collections of people. That's much harder to, to speak to with any certainty. Well, my next so there, question there's another, I'm be, sorry, it's a, another, no. a, sorry. I was just going to say, I was going to, um, my sort of next question was going to be on the sort of big sort of, um, finite, like global financial systems and sort of societal well-being. So, um, mm. I can dive into that if you want, but I don't know. I was going to kind of ask you, I'm aware we're kind of beginning to hit up against time. Are there any sort of areas that we've missed during this conversation that you think would be worth diving into? Or we could look at these sort of final couple of questions I've got. I, I don't want to um, waste our time asking a question that might not be helpful, but is, is there anything you think we can dive into that's going to help the, the viewer and listener kind of understand this sort of gateway into into the philosophy of money? One area in the philosophy of money that we haven't yet spoken about is individual ethics of money. And when we think about individual ethics of money, many of us just will reduce that to this question, how can I get more? Or how can I spend money well? Are there things I shouldn't buy? But I think there are other questions here as well that are salient. For example, can money make you happy? If so, how much? How do you exchange money for happiness? Happiness is what we all want. We all want to be happy. That much seems clear. Can getting more money make you happy? And let's say that the answer was tentatively yes. How would you have to spend it? And this is partly a question of psychology. It's partly a question of philosophy. That's why I locate it within philosophy of money. Because to answer it, we have to think about what happiness is and what it is that we really want. So these questions are maybe that feel like very different from the big picture questions we've been talking about, like the ethics of money production, but they might intersect in this way. Which money should you use for your own goals to be happy? In fact, we have various monies available to us. We're not stuck with just one. You can actually choose to buy and sell with a different kind of money. Now, maybe it'll be inconvenient to do so. The people around you want British pounds, and if you're trying to pay them in Bitcoin, maybe they'll resist. So maybe in the paying side, it might be difficult to use an alternative money. But in the receiving side, you may have more options. And there may be people around you who actually want to be paid, not in British pounds, but in US dollars, or in Bitcoin, or something else. All I, raise, all, all I mean to do to, to raise these questions is just to point towards the personal ethics side of philosophy of money that is of deep practical relevance in my opinion. And that actually intersects with what we're already talking about, which is uh, the selection of money and the, the big picture properties of money that make it good or bad and who benefits from them and so on. So a lot of fun stuff to think about there. I just, I want to flag that and then suggest, Oh, think about them. See what, see what happens. Yeah, that's huge. I think um, part of my space to kind of trying to understand I teach you class this on this uh, every year. Sorry, I interrupted Samuel. Oh, please. Um, so part of the thing that I've noticed around this is simply the fact that 
I am trying to earn money to support my family. I'm trying to kind of raise two boys, uh, married. Um, and there's this sort of kind of tension around kind of having to earn enough money to be able to look after them and also enough money for this sort of happiness to be a possibility. But then the more money you earn, potentially the more work you have to do or the harder the job becomes, potentially not always. And you kind mm. of begin to see this space being played out um, in, you know, you then ask questions about kind of why the money you held two years ago is buying less than it does today. And there just seems to be this sort of like cyclical cycle, which is just whatever you do, there's never quite enough. You're always trying to play catch up or you're trying to, to find the right balance. And this isn't an answer to your question. It's just more of a, of, of a reflection, this idea that kind mm. of money is a personal tool that can be utilized and expresses your, your desires so whether you do spend your money on a camera for the conversation we're having now or whether you go and buy a new car or whether you don't have enough to do those things these all add into our ability to um flourish within life and it really is it really does become a personal battle and, and conversation I, I know there's been some kind of actual mm. kind of um statistical work done on the amount of money somebody has to earn to uh, kind of reach a peak place and then the more money you add on doesn't necessarily increase your happiness, although it might do a little bit, but the sort of trend doesn't go up as much as it was at the start. And I think someone said something like 77,000 US dollars is like the peak number where for every 10,000 you earn more, there's a, a massive step up in sort of happiness. And then when you get to that point, and correct me if I'm wrong, you begin to see there's still a step up, but it vastly kind of decreases in its sort of um, level of exponential growth. And, you know, if that's true, it's fascinating. Like, how do we get more and more people onto that amount of money? But that then answers or raises a whole host of other questions around, we've already mentioned money creation, money money growth, how we make sure people have enough without inflating things so that what people do currently have doesn't get too much. So it just feels like I've mentioned there kind of a few of these sort of um, cycles of, of causality where you want one thing, you act in a certain way, it produces something else. And these things actually kind of, almost begin to beat their own tail and kind of cause the problem to keep going. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Does any of that make any, any sense, Andrew? Absolutely. Uh, you're, you're raising more questions than answers here. And that's a sure sign that we're doing philosophy. So I'm not going to try to answer them, but just to say yes and amen. These are deep questions. <laughs> There's a lot more to think about here. On the empirical results, these used to be fairly clean, they were first published, most importantly, by Daniel Kahneman and his team in 2010. Just this year, some of that came into pretty serious question with a follow-up study. So it's less clear whether that $75,000 figure is accurate. And there's some, uh, some puzzling uh, counter data to that. But um, my own view is that there is probably a satiation point for most of us. That is a point at which there's diminishing returns for money. And you need to be prepared for that. If your goal is to make more money, it might be useful for you to have a number and be prepared to stop seeking money so vociferously once you've reached that number. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in this cycle of seeking more, 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 even if it's not making you happier. And that, that's something that I've observed in many wealthy people in my, you know, I'm almost 40, so I'm not, I'm not going to say my many years, my, my a couple of decades of life. I've, I've seen this enough times to, to call the pattern. Yeah, and it also kind of raises um, a whole host of ethical questions around things like how you can give money away and sort of earning to give and this sort of effective altruism stuff. I find that space to be incredibly interesting as well. I'm aware it's one we've not touched on and we won't dive mm. into it now, but it begins to really challenge you on how you view money as a tool and how much you actually need to be happy. Yes. Um, but yeah, we'll dive into that another time. Um, Andrew, obviously it's been a fantastic conversation. Where would you want to point people to, to uh, explore your work, to find out more about you and to maybe even connect online? I'm on Twitter. My handle there is resistance money. And my research group, we work in the philosophy of money with a special focus on Bitcoin and some related topics. Our website is resistance.money. You can find everything we talk about there. I'll even post a link to this conversation someday. And uh, I'd be happy to connect with anyone who wants to think more about these issues. I talk a lot about Bitcoin on Twitter, but in truth, I'm interested in everything having to do with money. 
So I'd, I'd be happy to connect with folks. Amazing. Well, I'll make sure there are links to obviously all those links as well as some of the books we mentioned during the conversation. So listener viewer, check out the description, find the links there and uh, yeah, enjoy going down the rabbit hole. Uh, Andrew, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you so much for all your time. Thank you, Samuel. A pleasure here as well. I'm glad we can connect. Thanks for checking out this episode. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And make sure you check us out over on Locals. Cheers. Cheers.